Let's get our Bibles ready. Hebrews chapter 6. And we're going to get right into the, the study tonight. And we're dealing with, again, a very, oh, I can't, I don't like to call it a messy verse because God's word is not messy. But it's very, it's very commonly mis, misrepresented, misunderstood. And uh, it's in Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to look at verse number 4 through 6. We already touched uh, base uh, verses 1 through 3. So we're getting right back into verse number 4. And uh, we'll go ahead and give you a second to turn there. I'm going to get a drink of water. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. The Bible says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, this the erroneous translation of this verse is for this is what a lot of doctrine, uh, uh, false doctrine teaching churches will say that this is indicative of a person who can lose their salvation. Now, again, let me assert and say that. Once you're saved, you are always saved. So you being saved is not contingent on, you staying saved is not contingent on you or I. It is contingent only on Jesus Christ. He is who keeps you saved. And the Holy Spirit is the earnest of your salvation. It is the proof of your salvation. So there is no individual that's saved here that does not have the Holy Spirit within them. The Pentecostal church will teach that there are members of the church that have the Holy Spirit and don't have the Holy Spirit. And they say that uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit is when all of a sudden you start speaking in tongues. And this is why it's one of those things that it's uh, you have achieved something great. If God gifts you the gift of tongues, and I'm going to tell you, the gift of tongues is not flapping your gums and uh, uh, rattling your tongue up and down in your mouth over and over again. That's not gift of tongues. Gift of tongues, and this is a little off topic, but I, I want you to be aware, gift of tongues was, was a, 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 very, a miraculous event and phenomena that God allowed to take place that he orchestrated in the book of Acts for an individual, let's say, for instance, they were preaching in... Um, Oh, let's say they were pre preaching in Hebrew, okay? And then God performed a miraculous event. And while they were speaking Hebrew, the listeners that were listening to this Jew preach was listening it into their native language. Right. That's what the gift of tongues is, the, the power of the, of the act of tongues. Now, the Bible says uh, all those things are done away with now. Uh, the Bible says, and when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. That, so a lot of that, that prophecy and uh, the act of mirac the miraculous dealings, the Bible says, when that which is perfect has come. Yeah. That's right here. Yeah. We have the Bible, so yeah. there's no need to hear tongues because we can translate the word of God. Amen? So just so you have a, a little bit of understanding on that. Now, I want you to see here in verse number six, it, the, the term I want you to zoom in on there is, if they shall fall away. Now, this is not falling away or failing away from the grace of God. Grace of God is eternal, all right? It's a gift that was given to you that will not be revoked. It is a gift. Gifts cannot be revoked, okay? Uh, you may be do it differently, but God does not do think gifts giving differently. He gives it to you without strings attached, uh, it is a very much a free gift. So this phrase we see, fall away, is a reference to those who have tasted the truth, not having come all the way to faith, and they fall away from the, even the revelation they have been given. So the preaching that they hear, this is, a, this is in reference to a person who's sitting in church, they hear the word of God preached, and they feel the impression of the Holy Spirit within their life, in their heart, and hears what he has to say, is saying, you are lost. Or, uh, or you're not saved. And they hear those things, and the Bible says that they fall away. They turn away from it. That's what that's talking about. It's a turning away from that event. Now, tasting the truth is not enough to keep them from falling away from it. What I mean by that is this, is that a person who's tasted of the truth, meaning they've heard the preaching of the Word of God, they've seen the Word of God with their own eyes, they've tasted of it, 
that does not guarantee that they're going to be saved. Y'all follow what I'm saying? That does not guarantee. They need to consume it. Not just taste test it, all right? I like going to Costco and Sam's Club for that very reason. It is the, it is the buffet of the broke college student. Can I get an amen, Brother Allen? It is a buffet for the broke college student. I can't tell you how many times I'd go in there. That was when they didn't frisk you for your Sam's Club card. And, uh, you know, like you're breaking the law just by entering into the building. I mean, good grief. You know, believe me, there's nothing in here that I really absolutely have to have. But uh, I'd go in there and sample everything. And maybe, maybe that's why they're doing it now, to keep me out. I don't know. I do have a membership, all right? But... Uh, Taste testing it is not actually buying it. Okay? you got to buy into it, the truth. Not just taste the truth. So I hope that little analogy kind of brings them a little, bit, uh, a little bit more understanding. But they must come all the way to Christ in complete repentance and faith. Otherwise, they in fact re-crucify Christ and treat him contemptuously. So they make Christ's sacrifice of none effect in their life. They take that gift that's been given and, and the proverbial, they spit in God's face when they reject the Holy Spirit's wooing and conviction in their heart. They look at that and say, don't need it. That is, and, and that is something very, very uh, problematic. Now, this could lead into that, 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 uh, that possibility, that thought process of the, the unpardonable sin. Okay? Because the unpardonable sin is the rejection of the Holy Spirit. The rejection of His working in your life. The rejection of His repent, of the wooing for repentance. Because in order to be saved, you must have a heart of faith in Jesus Christ. And trust Jesus Christ and who He is. Now, the person who commits the unpardonable sin is saying that uh, this is not the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. Um, and I reject it. And that alone is enough for a person to die and go to hell. Yeah. The rejecting of the Holy Spirit's wooing in your life and trying to get you to a position where he is trying to get you to understand that Jesus is the only way. And when you hear preaching uh, and your response to it, that will determine largely the result of it. Those who sin against Christ in such a way have no hope of restoration or forgiveness because they reject Jesus Christ, with full knowledge and conscientious experience. They completely reject Jesus Christ. And, and here's, here's, the, here's what's uh, mind-boggling. Uh, how many of you got saved in here and you got saved the very first time you were presented with the gospel? Raise your hand. Okay. How about the second time? You heard the gospel presented to you the second time you got saved. How many of you, more than 10 times you heard the gospel and then you finally got saved? See what I'm saying? See, that's God's grace right. and his mercy. See, he didn't have to give you 10 chances. Right. Once. That's all, that's all he, that's all he really, and right, that's all he really needed to do is give you one opportunity. And I'm glad, I'm glad that I didn't blow it at that one opportunity. In fact, I've heard the gospel many times. But I finally, I finally listened to the Holy Spirit of God, yeah. and I yield to Him. But these people, they, they fall away. They're turning away, and what they're doing is, is they're, it's a rejection. A adamant, vehement, no, that is the rejection that they, hit, that they face. And what they do is they, they conclude, within their action, they, they conclude that Jesus should have been crucified, that He was that he rightfully was in that place, that he did deserve to die. And it is impossible for them to be renewed to such repentance. Because they've... Uh, go, to, uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to give you a little bit more information on this as soon as we read this. Uh, look at verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now what happens if you sear something with a hot iron? Let's say it's your body. What happens to it? What, Brother Glenn? 
sealed up. But what happens to the nerve endings? Gone. They're dead. So the Bible here picks a, paints a picture here and says, if we continue to turn away, the Bible says, depart from the faith. Remember, the, here, here's the bridge here. They depart from the faith. What we do is inevitably sear our conscience, sear uh, God being able to speak through us. Now, the conscience, God creates everybody with a conscience, right? Even lost people have conscience, true? The conscience is that moral guide in your life. Don't think of Jiminy Cricket now, okay? That moral guide. And, but isn't it interesting? His initials are J.C., that's not coincidence, by the way. Uh, it was a slight little jab and mockery at Jesus Christ. Um, but uh, that's, that's I don't know, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll preach a series on the, the evils of Disney. I don't know. <laughs> but um, that searing, departing from the faith, okay, that's, that's the picture. So that person who rejects God, rejects his offer of salvation, and they continuously do it, they are searing that conscience to a point that they cannot get saved. What does the Bible say? My spirit shall not always strive with man. Yeah, right. right? God is not going to you know, arm wrestle you into getting saved. He's going, to, he's going to be a gentleman. He's going to ask you. He's going to petition you to be saved. And it's your responsibility and mine to, uh, to follow through with that and accept. But what's happened is their hearts have become so hardened due to rejecting the Holy Spirit's conviction. Quite simply, they are unwilling to repent. I, I think I alluded to this last week, that repentance is a gift given by God. It is a gift. A person cannot will to be repentant. It doesn't, you can't muster up the power to want to be repentant because you and I, our natural state is, is I'm right. I'm not wrong. I'm right. And it takes a in a foreign power, if I can be so vague, a foreign power to convince you you're wrong. His name is the Holy Spirit. And he comes into the life of the person through the preaching of the Bible when I or another preacher or a Sunday school teacher gets up and beats away at the pulpit and says, thus saith the Lord, um, you know, and they have a responsibility to, in the pew, obey the Holy Spirit of God or Reject them. Now, I want you to think here, um, two, two individuals here. Number one is Peter. I want you to think of Peter. How did Peter fall away? Sorry? He denied. He denied who? Denied Jesus. Jesus Christ. Who else did that day? Judas, Judas did. They both essentially did the same thing. They betrayed Jesus, did they not? What's the difference between the two? One desired to repent. The other was calloused and didn't. Here's the difference, Brother Thomas. You ready? The difference is Judas heard the same preaching and the same parables, the same, saw the same miracles, but you know what it did to Judas? calloused him. It calloused him. It made him more resistant to the gospel. Peter, on the other hand, you look at the contrast, you see it. You don't see Judas at all mentioned hardly ever, other than when it's, it's his cynicism is involved. But even then you see his heart. But Peter, on the opposite side of the spectrum, was always concerned with the, with the Lord. I mean, listening to the preaching, responding to the preaching, and ultimately, one was, one was restored. Now, I've heard some preachers, you know, and, say, and I, you know what? Nobody can say to me definitively that Judas is in hell. Now, do I believe that? Yeah, I do believe that. But you, what happened to Judas? Well, the Bible says he hung himself, and then his, his guts dashed against the rocks. We see all that. Um, he had, he had what, we, what wasn't repentance, but uh, grief from what he did. Grief is not repentance. Now, could he have gotten saved? I suppose anything's possible. 
I suppose Adolf Hitler could have gotten saved in the bunker too. But here's the thing, okay? The chances of any of those people repenting, very slim. Why? Because of their adamant rejection of Jesus Christ. Now, with that, uh, I'm going I'm to turn you to Matthew chapter 13. We're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a detour, but similar topic. Matthew chapter 13. Now, it's only a paragraph of my notes, so I really got to work here. I got to move along. He, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 13. Now, this is the parable of, of, the, of the sower here and the difference in the seed and different soil types. And so uh, many of you probably have read through this passage of Scripture already, uh, but it's verse number three. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprung up and choked them, but other fell into good ground and brought forth... Uh, Fruit, some in hundred, some in sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, what are these parables talking about or teaching? What is he, Jesus teaching about here? What's he teaching on? What's, what's the parable talking about? Okay. Right. But, yeah, Brother Thomas? Oh, I, thought you said, I thought I saw you raise your hand. Tracy. Okay, it is the different responses of hearing the gospel, but this, the parable is talking about the kingdom of God. Okay, this is talking about the kingdom of God. And all throughout Matthew chapter 13, these are all parables that talk about the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, rather. And so what is the, who is and what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, we are the kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of heaven? Hmm? Okay? We are the kingdom of the kingdom of God is is and I'm back now. I'm making my <laughs> okay. The kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of heaven is here. Okay? We are the inhabitants of heaven. Now what happens is is the kingdom of heaven, the Bible talks about these seeds are representative to the people who receive the message. The good seed, obviously you have the those that sowed the seeds that fell by the wayside, fowls came and devoured them up. These are all different responses. Uh, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. So I want you to see that see, that to soil, and I want you to see verse number eight soil. Now, just I, we could compare and contrast a lot through all these different verses, but for time's sake, we're going to compare the two. Both of them sprung up, didn't they? One lasted, the other didn't. The reason why is because there was no soil for it to grow into. Now, I'm going to segue into this because I want you to think about this because I'm going to segue into the same response when it comes to people in church. Now, some of the greatest religious zealots of the day in Jesus' ministry time was who? The Pharisees. the Pharisees. They are the religious zealots of the day. They were probably more religious than every person in this room combined. They were, more, they were far more religious than the most religious person. Hey, they were far more religious than the Pope. <laughs> now, on the one side, we clearly see that someone can have great spiritual experiences and still not be saved. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 7. You're in Matthew already. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. They can have spiritual experiences but still not be saved. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. All right. Now, verse number 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's the analogy. These people were doing many wonderful works in the name of Jesus Christ, weren't they? That's what the Bible says. They said, 
Uh, we prophesied in thy name. They cast out devils. They did many wonderful works. But what is the response of Jesus? What does he say? Never, Never knew you. So somebody could be the greatest soul winner that Trident Baptist Church has ever seen, but still die and go to hell. True stuff. Here's the, here's the, re, the reasoning behind that. Because it's all within their heart how they responded to the Holy Spirit they either have said no and rejected, saying, I don't need him, I don't need Jesus, but then tell other people that they need him. I'm telling you, at church, it happens. It does. And it, it happened clearly in this time, in the Hebrews, during that time frame. People rejecting the Holy Spirit, rejecting God. One can even do many religious things and still not be saved. The Pharisees in the New Testament, they were a perfect principle of all these things. Um, we look in uh, Matthew chapter 23, just uh, a few verses you'll see of what they did, these, these uh, Pharisees. Matthew 23, verse number 15. Uh, verse 15 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child, child of hell than yourselves. They, ev they energetically evangelized. You see that? They can pass sea and land to make a proselyte. That means they went throughout the lengths of whatever, whatever lengths they needed to go, Brother Thomas, to, to reach people, to try to convert them. Isn't that what the Bible says they did? That's what they would do. They would go to the very lengths of sea and land to try to convert people. They energetically evangelized. And I'll tell you what, evangelism is not just hopping around from church to church preaching either. That's not what an evangelist is. An evangelist is a person who goes out and witnesses to people and then tries to get them into church. That's what an evangelist does. Uh, they impressively prayed. Look at verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Again, we're talking about the, I mean, real, real, if you could call them real religious zealots. I mean, they had a handle on this religiosity. They would, they would witness to people. They would proselytize them. They'd pray lengthy prayers. But the Bible says that Jesus says that they were going to receive greater damnation. I mean, you'd think, wow, these people, of all people, they should be saved. Not so. Not so. Why? Because they rejected Jesus. That's why. That's why those Pharisees, now, with an exception of Nicodemus, I believe Nicodemus was, uh, was the exception. We see that. He came, Jesus came to Jesus, and, and Joseph, Pharaoh, Matthew, and, uh, and all of those men. That, uh, but I'll keep, we'll keep reading. Verse number 16, Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. They made rigorous religious commitments. I mean, they, they would, they would, I mean, they would, I mean, well, let's just keep going. Uh, they, uh, in verse number 23, verse 23, look at that. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have amid, omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, these ought ye have to have done, and not to leave the other undone. They strictly, they strictly and carefully t -t -t tithed. Tithing is in the New Testament. All right, still is. All right, I, I talked to a fellow not too long ago. It says we don't believe in the tithe. Well, it's not in the New Testament. Right there, there's your there's your proof positive. They were tithing even during Jesus's ministry. Um, they strictly and carefully tithed. They made sure to give everything to God. But yet, <laughs> they're still no more closer to heaven than they were before. Um, look at verse number 29, verse 31 through 31. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. So they honored religious traditions. 
they would, they would decorate the tombs of the prophets. I mean, they, they cared about those things, but yet the Bible says that they were they are the children of them which killed the prophets. Um, they practiced, for time, I won't have you turn there because it's in Luke chapter 8, but you can write it down. Luke chapter 18, verse 12. They practiced fasting regularly. I mean, any of these things, I guarantee you, if this list were to be demanded of me, I'd fail it. I mean, if I could be so bold to say, would you would too? And, but these guys, they got it all down. But you know what the Bible says? They would receive the greater damnation. Why? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. And they rejected the Holy Spirit's wooing in their heart. They heard the same preachers, or the preaching of Jesus Christ. They had the same opportunity to repent. And they didn't. And that made them hardened to the gospel. Hardened to, towards Jesus Christ. And here's the, ultimately what would happen. The Bible says that Jesus called them uh, in verse number 15, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus called them sons of hell. And they would make twice children the twice the child of hell. You see that? That's, that's some heavy things that Jesus is telling these guys. But this is all the truth. I talked to somebody today. I told him, uh, you know, sh she was mentioning about how uh, you know, some things that I say can be considered offensive to other people of different religions. And I said, listen, uh, it's my responsibility as a preacher to preach the truth and, and, and call out false doctrine and to, and to label it for what it is. And listen, I, I love people. I love Catholics. I love Methodists. I love Mormons. I love JWs. I just hate what they believe. I do. And I'm going to call it out for what it is. And listen. Jesus Christ did it. You see right here, Matthew 23. He nailed these guys in front of everybody. Nailed them. And I told this person, I said, Jesus did it. And I try to model my preaching after Jesus. I'm far from it. But I, if he did it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call out false doctrine. I'm going to. But here's what the Bible says. Their, their end was hell. That's what their end was. From human perspective. It is doubtful that anyone would have seen, had, would have had better credentials than the Pharisees. But even then, they would not be regarded as a true Christian. They had great credentials. If they were to be hired as a Christian, <laughs> these guys were a shoe in. They got it down. But they still, they still weren't going to be citizens of hell. God knows their ultimate destiny. And, and prayerfully, the individual should as well. And when we have the, the opportunity to realize of our, of our impending doom and call out to Jesus with a heart of repentance that God gifts to us, hopefully, in turn, you say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner, like that, like that, like that uh, publican. God, be merciful to me. That's what he said. The Bible says he smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What was the difference between him and the guy praying beside him? I thank thee that thou art not like this publican. What is that? No conviction. No conviction. That's the epidemic that we face even today. There will be people. I, I, have more, I have more respect for a guy who's got tracked, tr railroad tracks on his arms and comes to this altar bawling his eyes out, smells like he hadn't taken a shower in two weeks, I would be more, I, I, God looks upon that heart and says, I want it, I'm going to save that. Then the person who sits there in the three-piece suit and the fanciest dress they found at Macy's, and they say, well, I'm okay. I'm, I'm thankful I'm not like that person. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Let's be careful to make sure that, one, if we're saved, you better remember where you came from. Better remember who you are. And then if, if you're not saved, Pray to God and ask him to work in your heart that he might save you and convict you of your sin. Boy, because I'm going to tell you, listen, there are a lot of people in Baptist churches today. What, who is it? D.L. Moody? D.L. Moody said that he, he perceived that more than half of his congregation were going to die and go to hell. Is that the right? D.L. Moody said that? Yeah. More than half of his congregation would die and go to hell. That's what that great preacher said. 
What was the reasoning? Because there was a, it was a, oh, what do they call it? The uh, family members would induct other family members into church because of their familial ties. And they would just be part of the church. I mean, that's what the preacher D.L. Moody said. And I still believe in it's happening today. People are coming to church, singing the songs of the faith, but yet their, their eternal destination is hell. It's not because they're not perfect enough, it's not because, but it's a simple thing of they've rejected or have not responded to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> beyond knowledge, the hidden, yet behind, beyond the knowledge of the hidden in the mind of God, the individual in question, from all human observation, everything we perceive, we must say that these are the, are the Christians spoken of in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 5. And I use that term Christians loosely because they're really not Christians. They follow the teachings of Christ, but they're not Christians by birth. They follow the teachings. Um, a good example of this is Demas. Demas. Um, Look at Colossians chapter 4. And this is where we'll end the message tonight. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 14. I want you to see here. Paul here is, here is writing to the church of Colossae. And I want you to see in this verse what he says. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So at one point, Demas is greeting and then turn to Philemon. Now you're going to have to start working on that one. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, just before. Philemon, verse 24. The Bible says, Marcus and Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So here is... Here is, again, Demas being mentioned as a co-laborer, a fellow laborer. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10, the Bible says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Taking this all together, we see that it's possible to, to display some fruit or spiritual growth than to die spiritually, showing that the soil of the heart was never right to begin with. Talking about Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13. So, to, to, put, it, to put it bluntly and to, to, to wrap all this to a, a close, just because you do something does not, does not prove of who you really are. Just because I can bark like a dog, but that doesn't make me a dog. I mean, that's a crude illustration, but I hope you it's, it's hitting home here. I can, I can act like an animal, but that doesn't make me an animal. And a, a person can act like a Christian, but that doesn't make him a Christian. So this is that falling away that we're talking about, a rejection, a turning away of the Holy Spirit, a turning away of the working of God in their heart. And the Bible says, I'll go back to there. I, I had to, I had you turn be done, but I, I'm going to close that verse again. We're going to, we're almost done with this this portion of scripture in chapter six. There, Hebrews again, Hebrews chapter six, verse four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Again, that word partakers is simply to go, to go along with. Um, if they shall fall away. For, so if you, want, if you want to kind of, I did this, drew an arrow from the first phrase of chapter 4. For it is impossible to down to verse number 6, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put to him in open shame. You know the person who would crucify Jesus Christ afresh as a person who never cared about his first crucifixion. It's a person who didn't care about the first crucifixion. And they themselves were complicit in the crucifying. So church, this is, this is again, this is, this is what the scripture is talking about. Not saying that a person can lose their salvation because again, John 3.16 
First John 5, 13. Uh, it's eternal life. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. All these things, they, they show that you cannot lose your salvation. Uh, but here, here again, here's the issue. Um, if you're saved, you can't lose your salvation. But on the same token of that, you must receive that gift with a willing heart in order to be saved. God's not going to force people to be saved. We're not Calvinists here, where God's going to save you against your will. All right, it doesn't matter. You're the elect, and you're going to heaven. That's not what happens. It's not. It's it's that's that's a a lie, is what that is. But a person can be saved when they yield to the Holy Spirit and say, "I'm wrong. You're right. I repent. I don't turn away from you." I turn away from what I'm holding on to that takes me to heaven, or I think will take me to heaven. There's got to be a turning away from something. Either you're going to turn away from God, or you're going to turn away from everything you think will get you to heaven. And that could be your good works. It could be your baptism. It could be your church membership. It could be anything. There's, a, I mean, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You go through the list. There's so many people holding on to things they think will get them to heaven, but are not going to get them to heaven. You need to completely and totally rely upon Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross and uh, to get you to get to heaven. And uh, so would you bow your head and close your eyes? We're going to close the message tonight. Father, thank you for the study tonight. Thank you how you've spoken to many hearts in here, and mine own included. I pray that we will continue to study this, and, and God, may we apply it to our lives. The truths that we see here, help us to never reject you Help us to never reject your wooing. Lord, I don't want to sear my conscience. I don't want to harden my heart. Lord, I don't want to grieve your Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that we'll all just be tender to your leading and yielded to your will. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.